they had the lunch on today and uh, there were diplomats there, I think journalists and public officials and it was a lunch one in reference to their recent uh, removal of the death penalty law and the defamation of the president law. Now those laws when removing them, they have a right to remove them. They don't need approval from anybody apparently so they can remove them which they have done. Uh, I have not been, as you all know, I've expressed some displeasure with that. Sometimes it's not what they do, it's the way they do it. It's almost as if uh, the opinion or concerns or thoughts of uh, their electorate, the people who put them in power, are irrelevant. There was no consultation. There was no deliberation. There was nothing to show that at least our views are respected or considered. They just woke up one day and decided they're going to abolish these things. Now, the country is divided. Some say it's good, some say it's bad. I don't think it's good I, in the sense that, uh, first of all, we have to understand why those laws were on the books in the first place. Yes, I understand they've been there since independence and even before independence. But is it a priority? Is it really necessary? Are we ready? These are important questions that need to be answered. You don't just wake up one morning and say we're going to remove them. And what I find more unsettling than even their lack of consultation is the fact that... Look, I've been studying Zambian politics since I was 19 years old, okay? I wasn't born yesterday. I've been studying Zambian politics since I was 19 years old. These are diplomats who are bringing these laws in Zambia. Make no mistake about that. Of course, I can't prove it. I can only suspect based on my experiences and how I know how these political things operate. This is not our head of state talking. This is diplomats talking through our head of state to us. No consultation. These are diplomats stationed in Osaka telling the president that remove defamation of the law. Remove death penalty. Why? Because we have removed it in Europe. Well, at independence, it was there. We adopted those laws from Britain. So we adopted, we copied. Okay, fine. But fast forward some 58 years later when they have removed those laws. Now they come to us and say, remove them as well. So does that mean that whatever they say, we have to do? No consultation with the people, no going to the people and say, Moima Zambians, how do you feel about this? Are you comfortable with it? Even if it's what the government wants to do, they can present their case forward and say, look, Bani, we have a responsibility to lead and therefore we're going to lead and let us explain to you properly why we're getting rid of this, but tell us what your concerns are as well. You mean you can't debate with your people, even if you have the right to remove it. You can't engage your people and your lawmakers to say what are the pros and cons? Are we ready? Is it wise? Do we have the resources to entertain a scenario where there's no death penalty, where there's no defamation of the president? Look, the diplomats in Lusaka have become too powerful. The foreign diplomatic corps in Lusaka has become too powerful. They are calling the shots. They are bringing their ideologies in Zambia. It may bother some people and it may not bother others. But I think it's a bit unsettling how the diplomats, foreign diplomats, have assumed so much power. And that power extends to the minds, but it also extends to how we are living in Mozambique. In terms of, should we have the death penalty or not? Should we have the defamation of the president law or not. Listen, I already explained last week or the week before then that a president does not have to have anyone executed. They do not have to sign that paper. They can exercise what we call prerogative of mercy. If the president doesn't want to hang anyone or to have anyone hanged, they can exercise prerogative of the president 
prerogative of mercy rather. That's in the law. But you don't have to scrap the death penalty out of the books completely. Keep it in the books so that it's there and people know that it's there and there's always a possibility that it could be enforced if someone does something that is so heinous and destructive to society. You see what I'm saying? So, first of all, it's just not necessary, it's not relevant, we've got other things to deal with, we've got other things to think about. But just because Europe feels that it's now old-fashioned and they don't want it anymore, they come to Zambia and impose those things. Now, but today they are. But rest, rest assured, it doesn't just end there. This was easy. It was small potatoes for them to deal with. Even when they said remove defamation of the president, because we don't have defamation of the president in Europe. In our African culture, we are taught to respect our elders, we are taught to respect our leaders. It is part of our value system. Even as we provide, even as we exercise democracy, we should not get into that business of insulting the presidents. There is a code of conduct, a culture that we must adhere to. Yes, I understand it has gotten out of line. People have shown a lot of disrespect to the president, not just the current one, but even the previous ones. That is unsettling. But removing the defamation of the president law obviously doesn't remedy the problem. In fact, it might even make it worse. The insults will now just be all over the place. But it's of, it's of no use, it's no good. On the other hand, the defamation of the president law was being misused and abused. So maybe it's a good law to remove, but to remove it out of our own accord, our own understanding and our own agreement, not just because the European diplomats have told you to remove it, so you remove it. Then what's the point of having a president? You remove the death penalty. You know there are people who do ritual killings in Zambia. There are people who can do mass murder. There are people who can do espionage. There are people who can do such serious, heinous crimes that they need to know that the death penalty is a possibility. Look, anyway, the point is whether it's right or wrong, that's a whole different matter. But the fact that we have European diplomats stationed in Lusak telling us what to do, I think is a bit unsettling. If they have their way, I mean, they have tested the waters on this, and I'm not going to go so deep into it. But if they had the way, and they've been testing the waters, panono panono vade vendele la fia fini. But if we are, idele ashi, awa ome kutema, awa ome, awa nakashu kutema, awa nakashu. Okay. Listen, I'm not going to do too much on that. Uh, I believe that we should respect, as long as someone is a human being, respect everybody, treat everybody with respect and with dignity, have no hatred, cause no harm, cause no injury. I believe on those, on those much bigger, wider, deeper concepts. But my point is, if there are any laws that ever happen in Zambia, let them happen out of deliberation and debate among Zambians, between Zambians and their leaders. Not because we are Finnish ambassador, we are not going to be Zambia. Or we are Swedish ambassador, we are not going to be Zambia. So much to be Finnish. They are going to be in the Vila. They are not going to be They know that it's not something that will be accepted so fast. So, until it sneaks, sneaks into society and becomes widely acceptable. Look, that's a whole different debate altogether. But my point is, have we become a puppet regime? That's my point. We can have debate on all these social issues and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, what's cultural and what's not cultural, what's religious and what's not religious. Listen, I'm not going to hate anybody. I'm not going to disrespect anybody. I'm going to love everybody. I will respect everybody. I will treat everybody with respect and with dignity because those are the concepts that I'm trying to promote for myself and my followers. But, but what I find unsettling is the fact that Europeans think that they can just come to Zambia using their diplomats and their ambassadors and their high commissioners to be pushing us around and injecting these things in Zambia. Then what is independence for? Then it means 1964 was irrelevant. Then don't even say Zambia is a sovereign state. It's not. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a puppet regime. We have never had a puppet regime. We've had Zambian governments that have been aligned 
either to the east or west or none aligned. We've been able to hold our ground one way or another. But I've never seen anything like what we are seeing right now. I have never seen such spineless leadership in Zambia. Now, by the end of the day, people have to decide whether that's okay or whether that's not. To what extent they're able to accept that, to what extent they're able to reject that. And it could also be a bargain between economic progress and losing some of our independence. By the end of the day, people have to decide. It could be that, you see, again, the president in his last press conference said that there are certain things, especially in the mining sector, that will be unlocked in the first quarter of 2023. So these investments will yield and we'll start seeing results. If that happens, great, good. Because I want us to get out of this economic hardship. Okay. If his alliances and his devotion to his Western friends yields economically, the uh, progress and development and jobs for Zambia. Maybe by the end of the day, people will be willing to accept that as a bargain. Economic prosperity in exchange for losing some of our independence. It's up to people. It's not up to me. It will be up to people to decide if that's what they are willing to accept. <laughs> it will be up to people. Either economics or independence. You know, it's a bargain. We live in a world of bargain. We live in a world of negotiation. So maybe they'll give us all the sweets and chocolates and biscuits in exchange for us doing what they tell us to do. But there's a deeper dark side to this. They are not just trying to spread their ideology. They are after our minds. That's why I keep telling people, be careful with privatization part two. Because privatization part two is a, is, a, is a real possibility. They are sneaky. It's not enough to just spread the ideology. It's called neocolonialism. Neocolonialism. I can't pronounce it. You know there was colonization where they came physically, incapacitated us, and physically took our minerals and took it to Fiarofiao. But ever since independence, what they said, Mumma meetings, Yawawa Sungawa. But let them have their independence, it's okay. But I can feel their feeling. Let them have power. Mumfa Kobuino. Let them lead the show. But when it comes to economics, Ilia we are going to be so involved in those activities because travel have a minerals, Yawa. So the system that they developed was one of remote control, neo colonialism. But neo colonialism has become a phenomenon that came later on because what happened after independence there was what you call the cold war where people had to choose between east and west and there was that program you have a cia our american our m16 our britain and these other shushushus from other countries that program was designed such that if you're an african president standing for your people you know it's side in our east we communist nishi they will channel your money to have you taken out. If you have that, that was at the height of the Cold War because the stakes were very high. It was a serious, dangerous competition between East and West. But the Berlin War fell in 1989 and the Cold War came to an end. And those African presidents who were siding with the East, they were told, you have to democratize, you have no choice. You don't have power. You don't have the Soviet Union backing you anymore. So you now have to democratize, which was good, okay? So we democratized. We democratized. Okay, fine. Can we do a Soviet Union? They are no longer powerful. They can't back us. They can't give us what we need. The now dominant force is the West. So African dictators were forced to democratize. They were forced to privatize. And some of them put up some resistance. Some of them embraced it with both hands. Some became radical capitalists. But you see, one thing that has remained stubbornly, stubbornly the same between that time when the Soviet Union collapsed and Zambians democratized and Africa, the, the wave of democracy was sweeping across Africa. Africa democratized in the 1990s, 80s going into the 90s. Between that time and today, the percentage of Africans living in poverty at that time is still the same percentage today. 
it is the same percentage today so in 1991 85% of zambians were living in poverty 1991 we democratized we capitalized we started kissing the imf and the world bank from 1991 to today so much has happened we've gravitated west we've gravitated east we've invited the imf we qualified for the hipic initiative high indebted poor countries initiative at some point we brought the debt down to zero now it has gone up to 30, 30, 30 almost 30 billion a total debt so many things have happened between 1991 and today i think we've had about five or six presidents and yet the percentage of zambians living in poverty today is still the same percentage or more than the percentage of zambians who are living in poverty in 1991 poverty